So Mike, thank you for coming. The, the, the main reason that I wanted to put this on tape is because throughout our years of uh, acquaintanceship, I never actually had the opportunity to ask you a question in a way that I could actually show other people what your answer is um, when I think that you have some pretty good insights into what's about to come and into the future. You've demonstrated to this to me a few times in the past. You would be thinking about what's the next big thing is, and lo and behold, sometimes five years later, sometimes five months later, I would start hearing about this and reading about this in the literature and so on. And I realize that there's a certain element of randomness to this and a certain element of luck to this, but there's also a certain element of um, uh, fortitude and forward thinking. And I just wanted to ask you, as somebody who's been doing cognitive science and cognitive neuroscience and cognitive psychology for so many years, and realizing that you're not necessarily reading the literature the same way that you were reading the literature before, um, I think that we all read differently depending on where we are in our lives. What's the next big thing, in, in your opinion, and, and, and why? And how do you think about the next big thing, like when you think about it? Like, is there a particular, is it something that comes to you intuitively, or is it something that you are trying to figure out with yourself what would be the next big thing in a particular field? Uh, I ran into the next big thing, I think, but I don't know if it will be the next big thing. But uh, as you probably know, we found changes in the white matter of the brain when people are given one month of meditation training. And subsequently, I was able to find that the most likely mechanism for this is a change in the frontal theta rhythm four to eight hertz rhythm that goes on the frontal lobe, goes over the frontal lobe when one's trained in meditation. And uh, of course, you know, we've been trying to develop a mouse model where we could see if that rhythm would actually change the brain's white matter. And we were successful in showing small changes in the white matter, myelination, as a result of that stimulation. I don't know how it will come in detail, but I think this opens up the possibility that we could make substantial changes in brains that have some sort of deficit due to aging or stroke or demyelinating disorders by this kind of stimulation. If that happened, and it could be therapeutic, and if also we could improve connectivity in the normal human brain, then I do think that would be an important uh, development for the field because it would give it a mechanism for changing the brain, which is rather different and built on pretty much on cognitive psychology or cognitive neuroscience principles of the importance of brain networks in controlling uh, cognition and emotion and so on. You know, one of the bigger and unexpected questions that I get, particularly from young people who are entering the field, um, they sometimes doubt that uh, animal work is uh, relevant to humans. And I find that uh, sometimes difficult to answer when they are engaging uh, in their questions. They say, but that's relevant only for rats or that's relevant only for monkeys. Why don't we do this experiment in humans? And when I try to explain that, you know, you've you got to start somewhere and you have to show, um, many of the arguments that I make, I feel psychologically are not appealing to them. There's something about working with animals and animal models that, and it's not just students, I think it's the large, you know, audience of people out there, they just say, well, wh how is it relevant to, to us? How is it relevant to, to humans? Um, do you think that? Do you think that there is more than we can say about the importance of animal studies other than to just say something like we, you got to start somewhere and you, you have to do it in a very systematic way? Or The main issue is that you can get approval and of course this is a difficult ethical issue as it is with humans and other animals but you can get approval for more invasive methods and for example uh, op optogenetics allows control of certain 
sets of neurons within the brain of rodents, not possible in the human. But once you have control of those neurons, they're also present in the human. And you can uh, get very precise localization and very precise control, test different things that might have an effect on humans. So, for example, a minute ago, I was talking about our mouse model for looking at white matter changes. And we were able to do electron microscopy on these rat, uh, mice and uh, see the change in white matter. And uh, of course, fMRI can tell you whether there's a white matter change, but it's an indirect inference from MRI statistics. If you can actually see it, then that gives you a little more confidence in the, its being present. And uh, then, of course, even though you can't get so precise in the human, you may entertain the possibility it could have therapeutic or uh, improvement in, of some aspects of human information processing. What about people who are taking um, animal studies and trying to conclude things about consciousness or, or you know, things that are going into the, where we have a problem as humans even attributing this uh, particular component to so, at least some animals. Do you think that it makes sense to talk about uh, consciousness research, awareness, metacognitive, you know, things like that, when you're dealing with animal models, if you're doing higher order brain functions? Well, I don't think it makes much sense to talk directly about consciousness. But consciousness it can be broken down into elements. And those elements can be studied at many different levels. And for example, if you want to test ideas about whether particular neurons are involved in consciousness, or if you want to see whether one set of neurons triggers other sets of neurons and together they lead to consciousness, then the rat allows you to test whether you can actually activate those neurons, whether they will, in fact, uh, activate other parts of the network and so on. That doesn't mean that you've studied, solved the problem of consciousness, but the cr crucial question is, do you get insights that allow you to test things in humans and find out whether you have changed the nature of their conscious experience. Yeah, I mean, the, this, this approach of breaking down is also um, something that I find uh, sometimes difficult to communicate to people who have a very holistic approach to, to, to the brain and they don't necessarily look at components or subcomponents. And I, I know that I personally was very influenced by your uh, model of attention back, you know, from the, I guess the 70s, the early 70s, maybe it's even the late 60s, it depends how you count, but, but I would say early 70s. Um, to me, the, the, the approach that you outlined back then with uh, trying to describe different mechanisms of control or different networks of, of control um, is something that, you know, we still talk about today and maybe the terminology changes a little bit, maybe people use slightly different technologies and so on, but the model itself is still very much alive and very much um, uh, helpful to understanding what's going on. How do you see from where you are now looking back, how do you see what happened to your initial suggestion of the model and how people are applying it today? Yes, I do think that happens. I mean, uh, I suppose the best example is uh, Roger Shepard's idea of mental rotation. I mean, of course, you can you could poo-poo it and say, well, no rotation gone inside the brain. But Georgopoulos and his colleagues showed that what produces the mental rotation is during the interval of the rotation, there are sets of neurons that get activated whose re resolution, whose vector, points in different directions between the one that you start with and the one that you end with. It is a rotation. Mm -hmm. The neurons themselves are not rotating, but once you understand what they are doing, you can understand why at another level it made perfect sense for Shepard to call this mental rotation. And I think that same thing really applies to the shifting of the spotlight. That is, it isn't that the, that the things go, blinks off and goes on someplace else. It's stimulating a sets of neurons which have optimal locations and you arrive at the correct location. So 
uh, I think you, you know, you can uh, hope that there'll be a tight connection between the underlying neuronal story and the stories told psychologically. It's certainly still good when you're trying to explain the whole process to use metaphors, but of course you always like to have mechanism behind them. Do you find that your um, initial thinking about um, attentional networks, um, I'm sure it, it has evolved over the years and, and so on, but do you find that the basic idea that you had is still the same? Well, the basic idea really is don't think of things as unanalyzable. So you have a concept of attention, that's a lay term, and you have to ask what are the underlying components that make up that kind? That's the basic idea. That is, has lasted. People still try to find the underlying mechanisms that make up something. Science is about trying to be more precise by taking things apart. Mm -hmm. Even if you are, in the end, wanting to have a holistic theory, you still necessarily, I think, in trying to pursue that theory, have to take things apart. That's lasted for sure. Many details about what we thought in the initial state, there's been a lot of progress on it. And in fact, it's kind of surprising to me, my colleague Steve Peterson, got permission to write an article for the annual review 20 years later after our initial article and we described some of the uh, new findings that uh, elaborated the ideas and so on but in many ways they're, they're similar. This has been I mean nearly 50 years of, uh, of this uh, you know Posnerian trinity or whatever you know with Steve Peterson and other people you know that were involved in it um, do you think that do you think that this model needs a revamping in terms of how to think about it in a different way maybe endogenous versus exogenous attention or or something of that nature um, as opposed to alerting orienting an executive oh certainly could be in fact there are probably many ways to think about how to break apart attention into its components but I think the brain studies do provide a constraint because uh, you have to be able nowadays really to find the network in the brain that carries out this. So you can come up with a psychological idea, attention is this or that, but if you can't really show that the brain actually develops a network that, that instantiates that, that set of functions, then it maybe doesn't have as much uh, going for it. You know, when I was a graduate student, um, we were not allowed to ask explicitly questions about the unconscious and the conscious and awareness and visual awareness and things like that. It was just not part of the culture. And um, I mean, nobody, nobody said anything bad per se. Sometimes they did, but it was just not cool to, to, to do that. And it sort of demonstrated poor form. Today, it's exactly the opposite. If you don't ask any of these questions, that's poor form. I mean, you've you got to ask some of these questions and so on. And as a result, I think that we are living at a time where we have like proliferation of ideas that are sometimes not very scientific and they don't have much evidence to support them and so on. Now, you have, as part of your training and as part of, you know, you've been around the field for a long time, you know a little bit of, you know, about physics, you know a little bit about humans in general, you know a little bit about science, about behavioral science, about cognitive science. Um, do you think we're ready to attack questions such as, you know, trying to understand the neural underpinnings of human consciousness? Is it even, is it something within our grasp to, to make meaningful contributions to, or is it just way too philosophical a question to reduce in, in scientific terms or in psychological terms even? Well, I think we are approaching these questions and studying them. Um, the whole problem is people want to have one theory that takes care of everything. And we may be a long way from that. Maybe it won't happen. Maybe that doesn't turn out to be a unified function and therefore it has many different theories for different levels and so on. 
Uh, so that's, that's true. But whether we can make progress on the issue, I think it's very clear that we have made progress on the issue, that people can report, can fail to report on something, but that we can show all kinds of effects that it's having on their behavior by priming or by, uh, look, by looking at electrical recording or some other uh, method. So I think we have made progress. It, it, some people aren't very satisfied with progress if there isn't a, one overall theory that you know, it takes care of it. So uh, I myself can be fairly satisfied with progress because I never really expected to understand the whole thing. I just wanted to see if I could help understand it in the long run. And over the last 50 years, I think we've made some progress uh, it may not take 50 years, but hopefully we'll make more progress on the questions you're interested in. As, a, as somebody who comes with a, a bachelor's degree in physics, you're not, I mean, mathematics is something that, uh, that you feel, com at least at some point, you felt comfortable doing uh, to some extent. Never comfortable. <laughs> do, you, do you think that we're maybe moving towards a place where mathematical models are playing too big a role or maybe too small a role in our understanding of computational aspects of, of, of brain dynamics? Well, I mean, in the 70s, mathematical psychology was the leader. There was really a lot of effort to develop mathematical models which would sort of, everyone should test these mathematical models. So I think that was a mistake. That, that the mathematical model should set the occasion for all the experiments. I do think, however, there's a lot more interest in trying to get the network dynamics into mathematical form. That doesn't mean that you should give up exploring empirically these, uh, these networks, but it does provide a way of summarizing and uh, predicting and going from level to level so you can uh, develop network statistics or network mathematical models that give you some idea of how neurons should behave and you can test that. So I do think mathematics always plays a role in the development of empirical theory. I don't think it can play the role as if you have an equation and your basic job in empirical science is to test that equation but I think they can give you illumination. You know, I, I invest quite a bit of time sometimes working either with mathematical models that I later ask myself, what have I learned from them? Or um, I'm asking myself whether I should not invest more time in spending, you know, trying to understand something mathematically just in order to see whether there's some kind of a gist that I'm missing that the, that the model would, would capture. And, um, when I was young, it was, younger, it, it felt to me that this was just an exercise, an intellectual exercise almost. But today, sometimes I feel that it's actually calling for a specific balance in, in thinking about the problems. Like, I think that if we don't have a good formal models for particular problems, it sort of indicates that we don't have a good command of what the problem is. Uh, to a certain extent at least. I've worked for many years with people who were treating depression, psychiatrists who were treating depression. We don't have a good blood test or a good scan that we can do in order to see whether we're dealing with a depressed brain. We just don't have that. Um, yet millions of people are suffering from depression and we can sometimes offer them some relief. Um, but we don't really have a good fundamental understanding of depression to the point that we can do a scan or a blood test that would tell us explicitly this is a depressed brain. It doesn't mean that the problem is not real. It doesn't mean that you know it's not something that we can deal. I find that we run a lot against this problem in brain science and people who are not from brain science, are, it's difficult for them to understand that. They, they say like, what's, what's, what's the problem? Why don't you take a picture and see exactly what's, what's going on? And your book, Images of Mind, which was a very important book for me personally. I mean, I read that book and that was something that really got me into the field. Um, was as, I mean, it was probably as important to me as chronometric explorations, which was all about, you know, reaction time and accuracy uh, kind of uh, approaches. That's what I mean when I say that you are sort of looking into the future and you're able to sort of um, say this is the next big thing. If you had to write a book like that again, either chronometric explorations or images of mine, 
what would it be? What, what, what is the direction that you think is worth writing a book on and that would serve as sort of a launching pad for a good number of years ahead, just in terms of the maturity of the field and so on? Uh, I got to endorse uh, the direction my colleague, uh, Fawn Liu, has taken uh, in trying to understand the cortical column, which we know to be uh, duplicated to produce a brain. The cortex, at least the cortex of the brain, has columns all over. And they're pretty much the same in their organization, six layers and so on. A great deal is understood. And Fawn and Don Tucker together have been trying to use the cortical column uh, as a way of developing and understanding theories of how the communication of networks occurs. I think this is a very, I've been very impressed by their effort to do this. I'm sure many other people are doing this, trying to understand the nature of prediction within the brain and testing Bayesian models and so on. This is not a direction that I personally am going to take at my age, but uh, I think it's likely that there will be at least one and maybe many good books that uh, bridge the gap between the fundamental columns of the human cortex and its fundamental behavior via the network approach. You know, uh, you mentioned Fan Lu, and um, I still remember um, somewhere around 2000, a paper that you wrote with uh, Fan Lu and George Bush, of course, the real George Bush, um, and the whole story unfolding, um, you know, around um, what does the ACC do, you know, the interior cingulate, and, and are we talking about monitoring, are we talking about conflict resolution and the whole thing. With 20 years passing between, you know, that paper and where we are today, do you feel that we have a much clearer narrative about what the ACC does vis-a-vis -vis conflict resolution versus conflict monitoring? Is it something that you feel, you know, most people would say, yes, it does this, or no, it does that? Actually, I don't think most people would say either of those two things, but I would say that the uh, ACC does primarily, plays a role in resolution, but it has to recruit a portion of the ventral lateral cortex in order to make that role work in many of the brain areas that have been studied in vision and so on. That may not be so true in its uh, suppression of, say, hippocampal activity. So maybe some places in the brain, the ACC's connection will lead to inhibition of the activity of certain areas. Other, other things, new parts of the network have to be uh, involved in order to produce the suppression. So I think there's no new information I do think the insight that the ACC is playing a role in conflict resolution and therefore really a voluntary control, basically, because that's the basis of voluntary control. That is, you can do many different things, the brain is computing many different things, but if you're going to have any kind of a coherent set of behaviors, you've got to stick to some one set of goals and so on. And. Uh, I do believe the ACC is playing a very important role in that network. If I didn't believe it, I wouldn't be able to give the talk I'm going to give tomorrow. And, uh, and of course, I do believe that we now uh, maybe are understanding in more detail how this could occur. Do you think that um, the ACC or the involvement of the ACC in attention is a tiny bit overrated in the sense that it's always active in so many tasks that it's just very easy to catalog it or, or refer to it. Yeah, I don't think that's quite true. It is active in many tasks, that's true, but there are many predictable tasks that's not active. So you do a visual search task. If you do a very simple visual search task, it'll pop out it's not active. If you go to a conjunction search, which is, has another difficulty and novel stimuli, it is active. And so there's a boundary, yes, but uh, I think the bulk of the data has shown that it's 
Of course, I think people say, well, the ACC is involved in reward. And it is true that reward and punishment have important effects on the ACC, as they would have to be if you're going to be a control system and part of control. If you're going to resolve conflict in favor of one thing over another, you have to know what leads to reward, what leads to punishment. So uh, I think that there's been a failure of people to look at the broader literature and to try to integrate their ideas with other ideas in the literature. Now maybe we all fall victim of that, and I'm certainly a sinner on that too. But I think uh, that's an uh, important thing to do if you have a structure that's playing a very central role and you want to ask, is it playing some Im particular important role? So. Mike, this book that I just came out with, uh, How to Train the Brain, you were very kind to write the foreword for. And I've been thinking about this um, idea for this book for a while because um, you were the first person to introduce me to this idea of the nexus of education and development uh, with neuroscience and, and trying to put them together. Um, as I was putting this book together, I, I realized that there's, there's a lot of hype and, and, and a lot of weird things happening in the world that have nothing to do with science. But there's a lot of good leads out there and a lot of interesting potential to, to do things. I, want, I wanted to ask you from your perspective, um, how much do you think education should take from science in its current state? And should schools, the way that they're run today, um, I'm sending young kids to school, they feel very similar to the schools that I went to, uh, despite a lot more that we know, certainly in neuroscience and learning and memory and so on. Um, what, what would be like the biggest changes that you think we should advocate for implementing, if any? Well, I think the teacher is the crucial thing here. Teacher education really should have an element of understanding modern psychological work, including cognitive neuroscience and the other, quote, neurosciences, effective, social, and so on, be, so that they can identify things that they do in their curricula with possible things that have been learned. I don't think that, you know, something comes right out of the laboratory can be plugged into the school. But I do think that using, just like an engineer, with uh, some steeping, uh, some being steeped somewhat in physics and chemistry and so on, a good engineer can design a bridge or begin to design a bridge or some other artifact. So uh, to me, a teacher, is the crucial thing that has to understand something about brain activity, but it's a creative act to go from there to a curriculum that will, one, engage the students and, two, lead to the best results. I think so far we've concentrated only on sort of taking something from the neuroscience laboratory and giving it to the teacher, and I think probably there's a limit to how effective that can be. I mean, when I um, uh, first, I remember my reaction to uh, Fast Forward and, and, and you know, the, the, the early efforts of Paula Talal and Mike Merzenich and so on, and I, I found them to be really um, um, captivating. I mean, it captivated my mind that you can, you know, do, you know, things like that. Today, we have a lot of, you know, EEG that you can buy and, and use at home, consumer EEG. You can do stuff uh, with, the, with sleep. You can, can, you know, consolidate your memory through lucid dreaming. I mean, all kind. it's endless. I mean, people sell you all kinds of, uh, uh, of things. Um, do you think that there are some things that you, or that neuroscience could recommend to people um, that, you know, we as neuroscientists should stand behind and say, you know, we need to change on, you know, on this level based on evidence that we have? Um, there is a book by, um, uh, I think her name is Tahoma Epinoza from uh, Ecuador, who's taken a survey of neuroscience and neuroscientists and taken, tried to st distill this into insights into the uh, possible educational influence on a possible educational curricula. 
And I think she has some very good examples of success. I can't really reproduce them all for you, but um, I think there are some examples where there are good ideas. Do you think that's sort of the way of the future, or do you think that we're going to see not more and a, more? Not the way of the future, for sure, but a, a way which will be incorporated in the educational process. I mean, there's a lot of uh, pressures on education because we have gone from a kind of industrial society where people are kind of told exactly what repetitive tasks to do to a society where that is really handled by robots or other things and people are going to have to be involved in more creative aspects of design and so on and so that's a huge pressure on the schools to move away from you know kind of a, a more rote classroom situation to a project-oriented situation where kids are working together to develop projects and so on. That's happened, of course, to some extent, but not maybe as great as it needs to be. And, but uh, there are a lot of different pressures of which understanding of the brain is one. And of course, in my experience with teachers, if you give them information on brain activity, they're very interested in this and they want to understand it because they think it's relevant to their developing their relevant curriculum. I, I found that really quite a lot. So I do think it's one of the things that will contribute to education, not, not, the, not the one only thing by any means. I'm, I'm still struck, uh, even to this day, how you were able to demonstrate, you know, some 20 years ago that even a short which are Reda and, and so on, a, a short training of just a few days, um, you know, changes the brain signatures of, you know, young individuals in the direction of adults. And, and I think that that's exactly the kind of research that I would like to see more of. And I don't, I actually don't see that many, you know, research projects that take this up. It's a bold approach. It's a very, um, I would say, uh, it ta you take, you're taking a risk, you know, it's, it's not something that is uh, necessarily going to work out, but when it works, it sends a whole, you know, trajectory through, through the space and, and people are saying, wow, if you could do something like that. Do you feel that those leads were not taken up enough or do you think that we need to do more work in, in that vein? Well, uh, they have been taken up to some extent. And uh, I've just been writing a chapter called Enhancing Cognition for a volume uh, on uh, that's going to come out from eventually by Cambridge Press. Uh, and I've tried to summarize. Now, I, I think my main contribution is I've tried to summarize three different places where this kind of progress, I think to some extent progress, is taking place and uh, one of them has to do with training on individual cognitive tasks. The second one has to do with changing brain straight through things like physical exercise and meditation and the third thing deals with brain stimulation through e electrical or magnetic signals and I try to lay out what progress has been made. There's of course always skepticism uh, about any of these, but I think there have been some interesting uh, uh, developments which have taken forward some of the ideas. And I agree with you, particularly this one question about whether you can produce a general, more uh, self-controlled person. You can enhance self-control by training in early life uh, or in later life. Uh, this is a pretty important area of research, and there's, I, I was surprised by finding as much as I did on it. You're certainly right if you were to say, in terms of how much literature is coming out, is it a substantial percentage? The answer is no, it isn't a substantial percentage, but uh, there's some interesting findings, and I, I, I think things have shown some promise. Throughout your career, you've worked very closely with um, developmental psychologists, you know, Mary Rothbart is one prominent uh, such person, but your contributions 
uh, among other things, have shown, certainly to me, um, that sometimes measures of attention, measures of temperament, are sometimes more indicative of what's going to happen in the future than things like IQ or, I don't know, how if you're getting an A in a particular class. Um, I think that these messages are still lost, not just on educators and many educators, but also on parents. I think that this kind of information, which is quite available and has been substantiated time and again by multiple studies, is largely not making the rounds and people are somehow not getting it. And in, in my career, I have humbly noticed that sometimes it's not enough to put data out there and it's not enough to advocate for it. And some things just don't click with people. They just don't, somehow they don't pick it up or they don't bite into it. I'm not, I don't know how to call it. What's, what's your take on that? I mean, you, you, have, you and Mary and other people have demonstrated these very forcefully multiple times in many ways. And I still don't see that people are, you know, citing this or saying, I'm not talking about academics, I'm talking about educators. I'm talking about people who are interested, for example, in predicting how, you know, somebody's going to perform in the future. What's your, you know, what's your reaction to that? Um, I feel kind of like you do on this. Uh, I'm not a, myself a, a person who's been able to penetrate a lot of uh, uh, real-life situations, and, and so I, I don't know why this, why people don't take it up more. Uh, there are many competing directions, and so it's, it's difficult for sure. And it's very hard to penetrate the educational world in particular. Uh, and I, as I say, there are many pressures on teachers and administrators, political and social and all, uh, industrial and all this, as well as our own studies. So it's, it's difficult, I think, for any, any one idea to penetrate. <clears throat> I just, uh, I haven't got particularly discouraged. I just try to put the material out and hope that maybe some people will take it forward in better ways that will have more impact. Certainly, Carol Dweck's work has had a, quite a bit of impact. Sure. It's perhaps because it's fairly easy to implement compared to most of the stuff that we've uh, suggested. So sometimes you're lucky and sometimes you're not. <laughs> Yeah, and I, and, I, and I find that, you know, it's, um, uh, sometimes it's not enough to just put the information out there and to, you know, and to back it up with papers or, or, or with studies. Sometimes it's just some stories are sexier than others or, or some things are just more appealing to, to, to the wide readership or to the wide audience than others just based on completely sort of fluke parameters. It's very difficult, it's very, it's very difficult to predict which story is going to be more likable um, but it has nothing to do with the data sometimes. It has to do more with, with the narrative. And, uh, you know, I fi sometimes I find it frustrating. I mean, I, clearly, you, you, clearly it, it, does, it doesn't affect you in the same way. <laughs> I don't find it as frustrating as maybe you do. Images of Mind. Images of Mind was the closest that I have seen you write a popular book. I mean, granted, you did it with uh, Mark Rako, and, and, but it was Scientific American, and it was... You have done another, you have done another attention book uh, that I saw on, on, on later, many years later, on uh, the developing... Attention in the social brain social or social brain. educating the human brain? I think both, but I was, I was thinking about attention to the social brain. Yeah, it, it was uh, written as part of a series in social neuroscience. So it wasn't uh, in my intention to make it uh, something that would be for the lay person. It was really intended for graduate students or high upper degree, uh, upper division undergraduates who are working on cognitive neuroscience, basically. What, what do you think about what do you think about popular science? Well, I think it's great, but I don't think I could write a popular science book. I think that, that, that's difficult in any field of science. Yeah, I mean, some, some of them are really outstanding, and, you know, it's a gift to be able to write. Uh, I'm not saying that experience doesn't have something to do with it, but uh, it's great that people 
can do this, and of course there's academics who maybe can't do it, maybe putting books out or articles out that they might, someone who has this gift might synthesize and talk about, uh, that's you know, images of mine, part, I think part of the reason images of mine was so powerful, um, and it, it definitely was powerful for me personally, but I know for my peers, it wasn't just for me, um, is because it came at a time um, when the idea that you could actually uh, penetrate and um, the brain and look at brain activity um, in a largely non-invasive way, um, assuming the pet is non-invasive and all these things, um, was just a game changer. It was a game changer conceptually. Uh, today, of course, on every street corner you have either a magnet or, or, or a scanner of some sorts and so on. And, and do you think that neuroimaging has delivered or do you think a little bit like the, you know, uh, Utah kind of debate that you held in Chicago many years ago, um, that it's overrated? Uh, because uh, when I speak to young people today, they have a very different approach to these things. And uh, clearly they don't necessarily know the literature uh, the same way, but what do you think about neuroimaging today? I think it's delivered and it's overrated, both. I mean, it's, de it's delivered progress in our understanding of ne networks and that understanding of networks contributes to the psychological level as well as the, as well as the neuroscience level. So I think it has delivered much more than I would have hoped when I got into this. But that's not enough if you really want to have an answer to how the brain works. It hasn't delivered that answer. And people who think that it's delivered that answer are overrating it. It's just a contributor, maybe, to that answer. And of course, imaging has improved enormously since we did that early pet work. It's less invasive and more precise. So it has improved the whole apparatus. And one of its major contributions to me, maybe its best contribution, is the people it's attracted into the field. Because people who might have been working on bombs or uh, other things have turned their attention to brain activity, and uh, I think that's great. When um, when I wrote this book on casting, you know, light on the dark side of neuroimaging, it was very important for me. And by the way, both these books are completely Mike Posner books in the sense that you inspired me to write them, not through anything specific that you said, but just through the kind of research that you did and the the, the mentorship that you offered me, and 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 so on. And um, I really feel that many of the things that I wrote on neuroimaging is basically stuff that I wish somebody would have told me at some point about you know, how neuroimaging works and how it doesn't work. And I find that as I get older, um, maybe I'm getting a little bit disillusioned with certain things that I thought were really wild uh, when I was younger. And maybe it's just a normal aging process and maybe it's something else. But I wanted to ask you, are you getting or have you gotten disillusioned with some aspects of your research throughout the years, throughout your career? Well, yes, <laughs> many times, but uh, I don't think it's been an overall disillusionment. You know, you just realize that some approach that you had just either wasn't right or just isn't going anywhere. And so you maybe try something else, someone comes along who has a better approach. And I still remember you telling me that um, when uh, we did the ant in, in New York, uh, that it actually came to you in a dream. I mean, you had this kind of, uh, um, I, I don't know if, if, if it was a real dream or you were just pulling my leg, but you told me that you were dreaming about how you can get like these three measures simultaneously and uh, you know doing all these things. The way that I do science is not the same. I never dream about, like, I don't have an epiphany in my, in my sleep about things and so on, although I've heard that about benzene and I've heard, like, you know, there are other, other people. To me, science is 
hard work. Like I, I enjoy it very much, but I actually go and I think about problems and I read and I and I and I try and I do things like that. It feels to me, and I've seen you go to lectures, and then sometimes I would talk to you right after the lecture, and you would say to me, "Amir, I'm 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 still processing the lecture. Let's let's talk in 15 minutes or something." It feels to me that you're. The way that you think about things is, is fundamentally very different from other people that I've seen. Um, in the sense that you are, either it clicks with you faster or you're, you're just thinking about this in a, in a slightly different way. Certainly in a different way from many other people that I've seen. Um, is that something you, you noticed or is that like, it's it just natural for you? Like you don't, you don't pay attention to how other people think about these things? Well, I think I do pay attention to other people, what other people think, but I never came to the conclusion that I was an outlier. I think that a, a good outlier, like you, I, I find that, you know, often um, you make connections or you see things in, in the things that are happening um, that other people do not immediately see. Uh, and you can make and you can make cross references and and you can sort of see how things come together in a way that many people do not see. Uh, that's been my impression at least. Uh, and that's also something that allows you to sort of in a, quote unquote predict what the next big thing is going to be because you can sort of see how you know that's you know comes along. Well, that's a nice thing to have you say, but that's not anything I've observed. <laughs> right, it's difficult to observe it on you know with yourself. Um, I wanted to ask you if you feel that, so I got into the field of placebos um, mostly because I was interested in suggestion and my interest in suggestion really took off uh, when I was working with you in New York. Um, that's when I really started applying cognitive neuroscience paradigms to suggestion to see what, like to try to tease apart what is the effect of suggestion. Since that time um, I've gotten more sophisticated about it, and I think that other people have followed through with, with some of these things. And, you know, initially the experiments were difficult to replicate and so on, but they all panned out now and, you know, after so many years and so on. I feel that suggestion is completely overlooked or largely overlooked in the literature. Uh, people do not usually think about it very seriously. Um, what was your reaction when you know, I first came with, with these sort of weird ideas uh, about how suggestion plays a role in some of these things that are otherwise considered to be automatic, ballistic, and, you know, unaffected by these kind of things. Well, you're a very persuasive guy. So uh, I thought, oh, this is pretty far out. But, uh, you know, you, you, you brought them to very well-designed experiments. I mean, of course, no one ever knows whether every experiment will work in the future, but they, to me, they seem very well designed, seeing that you established some of the things that you'd said. At the time, you were still, uh, I thought, pretty focused on the hypnotism. The idea that you could produce suggestion in many different ways, I think, emerged maybe a little later, maybe later in our, but also maybe after you left. And I think that's turned out to be very productive, very well, good way to think about it because it brings together many different ideas. And you can think of many things as having a suggestion and you can see that that, that can be very effective. And I think you and other people who've worked on this have made a, a very good contribution here. And of course the placebo has gotten to be a very important topic and I know you you made a has it has it uh, has it influenced your your thinking about meditation and the effects of, of, of meditation well yes I mean to some extent because I know that it's so crit critically dependent on the person who helps you get into the med meditative state and uh, and that's of course a suggestion often very subtle not saying this but it's conducting the session in such a way as you do achieve this state. So, yes, I think it's very important. Of course, I've been focused more on what the mechanism mm -hmm. of meditation might be. And that, again, uh, 
insofar as I was right, and I, I don't know if I am, but if, as far as I was right, it explains the meditation effect, but it also leads in a very different direction, kind of like your idea of hypnotism did when it got connected to suggestion. Mm -hmm. uh, so often, you know, you get into one particular paradigm which you need to study something, but it, it leads to a, a much broader way of conceiving about the thing, connecting you to people working in what seem to be rather different areas. Yeah. So it shouldn't surprise you that my book on placebos and that my book on hypnosis and meditation are also Posner books in a way, because that you're, you're, you really influenced my thinking, you know, with these books as well. So, you know, for me personally, and, and this is an opportunity for me to say this to you, I will say this to you again and again. Uh, I really consider you uh, the biggest uh, professional influence on my career. And I say it with great respect and admiration because I don't think you've ever done anything different with me that you did with other people. It's just the kind of person that you are. Um, and I, I took a lot of um, uh, inspiration from you in, in how you do science and how you deal with setbacks and how you deal with, you know, departmental politics and how you shield us from, you know, these things. And even the Brain Institute here, um, in many ways, is uh, to me sort of a simulation of things that I've seen you do before. Um, and I want you to know that uh, this even percolates into my personal life sometimes. You know, I find myself, you know, saying when I deal with my kids, you know, what would Mike say to this or something like that. Um, and I just want to thank you so much for not just being my mentor and, and, and my postdoc supervisor, but for giving me the pleasure of going on this journey of doing this research, which I really like, and for um, giving me the, um, showing me the road and giving me the pleasure of doing uh, something that I really love, uh, thinking that I even understand a little bit about it. So thank you, Mike, for all these things. And thank you for coming to visit and being our premier and first Fajin uh, lecturer in a series that I think is going to carry for many years. Well, thank, thank you, so you very much. Thanks, Mike.